Psalm 119, beginning with verse number 89 tonight. At some point, we're also going to be over and we're going to look at 2 Peter. If you want to mark your Bibles there. together, just empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I just pray that you'll bless the uh, preaching of your word tonight, and Lord, I, I thank you for this opportunity to meet in your name, and Lord, I just pray that you'll, uh, you'll minister to us and uh, speak to each and every heart, and make it very clear tonight of what you'd have us to learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Psalm 119, and I've explained to you this is, the, this is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's all about the Word of God all about the Word of God. And uh, verse number 89 may be uh, the most important verse in the chapter. Maybe. I don't know. That's, that's, hard, to, that's hard to put a, a label on that. It's hard to, uh, I mean, I, I'm not the judge of that, but it's just, this is a very important verse. Uh, it's, it's crucial uh, to what we're doing. And so let's let's read uh, let's just read the first two words of verse number eighty nine. It says, "For ever, for ever." Now, what that means is eternal. All right, uh, it means everlasting, never ends, because it's forever. It's uh, infinity. It's going to go on and on and on and on. And that's really hard for us to ever get our minds wrapped around down here on earth because down here, everything ends. Everything is not permanent down here. Everything has a, uh, uh, a label on it that says uh, when it's going to go bad or go out of date. Uh, and so when we read words like forever, it's really hard for us to get our minds wrapped around that because everything down here has a time stamp. Everything on this earth has a time stamp. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word, God's word. Well, God's word, obviously at the time that the psalmist was writing this, was uh, the written word of God. At first it was the oral uh, it was given by oral tradition, and then uh, starting with Moses, men started to write it down. And so it's the written Word of God. Amen? Uh, Moses is the first human author that we, that we know of, of the Bible. And uh, something unique about that, he, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. Which, you know, let's do a little math. That means 61 of the books were not written by him, okay? But... Uh, the first five books were written by him, and I would like to also point out, four of those books, he was alive to see it happen. Okay? The first book, he was not. In fact, he wrote the first book 400 years after it had already come to fruition. The book of Genesis ended, and 400 years later, Moses is born. Okay? So Moses was not there for Genesis. It was told to him. He heard the accounts. It was passed on generation by generation. And so imagine being Moses. Imagine being him for just a second. And you hear how everything came to be. And here you are, a prince in a nation called Egypt. You're a prince. But you know that you're actually Hebrew. And your mother hid you when you were a baby. And hid you on the Nile River. And so you, know, you learn this because your mother is your nurse. And she tells you all these things. And she tells you the tradition of her people, the Jew Jewish people. And you find out all these things about, hey, God created us. Uh, in six literal days, he spoke uh, the earth into existence. He spoke everything on the earth into existence. But then he made us from the dust. And then uh, he, he made Adam and Eve. And then Adam and Eve fell into sin. And it has cursed this whole world. And, 
And so all of that stuff was passed on to Moses. He learned about the Tower of Babel. He learned about Noah and the Great Flood. He learned about Abraham. He learned about Isaac. And he learned about Jacob. And he learned about Joseph. And, and, then, and then he goes, oh, that's how we wound up in Egypt. Gotcha. So Moses understood those things. And so he wrote them down for us. And then you go into the book of Exodus, you get quite a bit more detail <laughs> uh, on, on what went on. Uh, quite a bit more is included, and, and that's because Moses was there for that. And then Leviticus, Moses records it for us, and uh, what God told him uh, the, the Levitical priesthood would, uh, would, would need to do. So Moses wrote that down for us. Uh, Moses wrote, it, wrote down the book of Numbers on why the Israelites did not get to go into the promised land with that generation. Why they had to wait 40 years. He recorded that for us, too. And then he recorded the book of Deuteronomy, which was right before his death, and he was basically reminding the people, after they'd been wandering around for 40 years, he was reminding them, hey, look, you have an obligation to the Lord. It's a, it's, this is a serious business. You don't want to wander around another 40 years. And so that was, Deuteronomy basically means second law. It basically means he was giving them the law the second time. And then the book of Joshua comes along, and it's right after Moses. You know, Joshua took, it, took over after Moses. And then the, the, the period of the judges. And uh, the judges take over right after Joshua. And then the, the, uh, the book of Ruth takes place during the time of judges. And then you have uh, Samuel, who's the last judge. And he records First and Second Samuel for us. And he transitions into the king, kingdom time because he anoints the first two kings. And then you have First and Second Kings. And then you have 1 and 2 Chronicles, which is the same time period as 1 and 2 Kings because it's the chronicles of the kings. And then you get into the prophets. And so we, we have, we, here's what I'm getting at. When you look at your Bible, we have an intact human history all the way back to the first ones. <laughs> all the way back. I mean, it, it's in depth. It's amazing. We have it all the way back. To the first two people. Amen. It goes all the way back. It covers them all. In fact, in, ex <laughs> in extraneous detail sometimes. God's Word, the written Word. And then you have the prophet, obviously the prophets write, uh, write down what the Lord gives them. You have the psalmist recording the, the book of Proverbs also. Uh, Solomon writes that down for us. and uh, Solomon also records Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And then, obviously, Jesus comes on the scene. And he's the Word in flesh. The Word incarnate. He fulfills the Word. And then we get the New Testament. And we get the four Gospels. So we have human history. And, 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 and by the way, Jesus was literally walking on this earth 2,000 years ago. We have human history that's not necessarily biblical. But we know what's gone on for the past 2,000 years. It's amazing because I'm telling you, we know what human history has been like. Since the beginning. Since the very beginning. God's Word has been written down. And God's Word has even been incarnate with Jesus Christ here. He came down here and literally fulfilled the Word of God. It is, it is mind-boggling to think about that. Forever, O Lord, Thy Word. And then it goes on and says, is settled. The word settled means established uh, 34 other times this Hebrew word appears and it's stand it's the word it's our English word stand it's translated stand uh, it, it means to set up it means erected it means established it means like a pillar forever O Lord thy word is established it is here it is settled it is you're, you're not it's, it's, it's set in place nobody's moving it nobody's moving it it's a rock. When, listen, nobody's changing Jesus. Nobody's going to go up to Jesus and, and convince him to change. Are you kidding? He's not changing because he's settled. Because he's the Word incarnate. He is settled. Okay? And the Word of God is settled. And then notice this. In heaven. That used to throw me for a loop a little bit when I would read this word. Because all the rest of that verse uh, gets me excited. Because it's forever. The word of God is settled. That's amazing. And then you come to, oh, in heaven. Well, I'm glad it's settled in heaven. Don't get me wrong. 
But it does make you stop and think, what about here? It, 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 when I, would, when I uh, first encountered that verse, and, and people would quote that verse for why God has preserved His Word. They would say, well, you know, forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. And I'd go, yeah, but that's in heaven. That doesn't necessarily say it's settled down here. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that it's settled in heaven. Well, I'm praising the Lord for that. I'm glad of that. But can I tell you, just like Jesus came down to this earth, can I tell you, the Word of God has come down to this earth, and it's come down to this earth perfectly. It has. I promise you that. Now, people are either going to believe that or they're not. It really doesn't... Uh, <laughs> listen, you believing something doesn't change it from being true or false. You can believe something that's false. And you can believe something that's true. And you can be very genuine in your beliefs. I'm... I'm I gotta tell you, I've I've, I've studied, I've seen some some things that Muslims believe, and they just as an example. I'm not trying to pick on them, but I don't agree with them. I believe many of them are actually very sincere in what they believe. I believe they are. I really do. I, I believe they're sincere enough. Some of them are so radicalized, they are so sincere in what they believe, they will run airplanes into towers. You cannot tell me those guys didn't believe it. Now I will tell you, I believe they're absolutely wrong in what they believe. Sincerely wrong. So, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. That's why I believe our human condition compels us to seek out truth. And that's why when Jesus makes a statement like, I am the truth, it's huge. Because he's basically saying, everything else is false. Everything else that says you can go to heaven this way is a lie. That's what he's saying. I mean, and then he said, and if you don't think so, in that same verse he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in case I'm not clear enough, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. If I haven't clarified it enough, he basically says. You say, well, wow, that, that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty hard stand. Even. Yeah, it was. He was willing to die for it. He was willing to make the people of his day mad about it. He wasn't trying to make them mad. I said he was willing to. He wasn't trying to anger anybody. He wanted people to realize he was the Word incarnate. He wanted people to realize he was truth incarnate. Thy Word is truth. Right? He wanted them to know that. Forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in heaven. Folks, I believe that. And like I said, that doesn't make it true, but I'm just I'm telling you, I've been convinced been convinced by this book. Settled in heaven. But what about on earth? What about on earth? Well, let's look at the rest of the psalm. Look at verse, look at verse number 90. Thy, talking about God, thy faithfulness, that means he's always steady. You can count on him. That's what that word faithfulness means. God's faithfulness the, the fact that you can count on Him, is unto all generations. Now, if He has made a promise to be faithful to all generations, wouldn't that mean that He has had to preserve His Word unto all generations? Now, you, you can disagree. You can say, well, I don't think He did. Well, okay. But that's what He's saying. He's saying He has preserved His Word. He's been faithful to every generation. Period. Every generation, He has made sure the Word of God has been here for them. There's been an opportunity, okay, let me put it to you like this. Every generation, there's been opportunities to be saved. Every generation, throughout time, whether you're talking about in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, there's been opportunities for people to receive the Word. To receive Jesus Christ. There's been opportunity. He's been faithful to every generation. You say, well, but it wasn't very popular during the 50 50,000th generation, whatever. It doesn't matter if it wasn't popular. I said it was available because he was faithful to all generations. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou, that's talking about God, has to, okay, and he goes on, he says, has to establish the earth and it abideth. He's basically now showing you, he's, he's going, you see how the earth has continued 
for so long, it just continues. Like, legitimately, anybody got to worry tomorrow that maybe the sun won't come up? I mean, I, I haven't counted how many days I've been alive. I turned 37 this year. Somebody do the math real quick. 37 times 365. I have no idea. That's a lot of days. That's a lot of days where the sun has come up. It comes up over here. It's come up, <laughs> and it goes back down. It's the same way every day. I, I, I can remember... Uh, uh, I, and this is, I, I know this is going to, I'm going to sound, I, I know I'm showing that I'm dumb here, but sometimes, I don't know, I've never thought about the sun rising, I've never thought about that, but I can remember one day when I was running the mail route early in the morning, and the sun was coming up, it dawned on me, man, that thing rises in the same spot every day. Oh yeah, I forgot, it does that. Every day, around the same time. I mean, it's just. It does the same thing. Anybody worried it's not going to do that tomorrow? Like legitimately? Anybody think the sky is falling? I haven't heard anybody. I've never walked up to anybody and, uh, uh, you know, Hi, hey, how you doing? Oh, I don't know. I'm worried about the sun not coming up tomorrow. We just know it's going to happen, right? I mean, it's that sure. It is that established. Thou hast established the earth. And it abideth. It just is. It's like he put it on cruise control, and it just works. Gravity works. Oxygen works. The, the water systems work. All of it works. It's a little out of whack. That's why sometimes we have nature problems. But nobody's really that concerned about, oh, I know they're concerned about climate control and stuff, but most of that, they're just kind of kooky. But uh, nobody's worried about the sun not. I mean, anybody worried about gravity not working tomorrow? would be crazy, wouldn't we? Because it just works. And it just works because he's put it in place. And he's established it. And it's perfect. And, and, and it, like that, like he has established that, that's how much he's established his word. That's how much he has made sure his word has been here. It's been available to people if they wanted it. It goes on, it says, verse number 91, They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. And that's, that's talking about the creation. He goes on, and now he gets back talking about the word of God. Look at verse 92. The psalmist says, Unless thy law, that's the word of God, had been my delight, I should have, then, I should have perished in my affliction. Okay, so right here, hold on, I want you to pause right here, hit the pause button and think about what he's saying. He's saying, the word of God has been my delight, and so I didn't perish in my affliction. So right here he's saying, I do have the word of God. I found it. And it helped me out of my afflictions. You see that? How many, who in here can testify that when you live according to the word of God, when you start doing what the, the word says, life starts working a lot better. I didn't say everything's perfectly smooth sailing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, even when things do go wrong, you stick with the Word of God, things start shaping up a little bit. Jesus steadies us and solidifies us and takes us through it. I have found that, you know, I grew up in a Christian household, and I like to say this, when it comes to peer pressure and things of that nature, living for the Lord is hard. But living for the devil is much harder. And I would say, when I was a teenager, or even in my early 20s, I thought living for the devil was easy. And I thought living for the Lord was hard. But then I found that the way of transgressors is hard. Oh, wait, the Bible said that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I actually started finding that actually living for the Lord is a little bit, quite a bit easier than I thought. It was hard because my flesh didn't like it. Actually, living for the Lord is a lot easier than living for the devil because the devil has some serious repercussions when you do what he tells you. Serious repercussions. What, so, I'm telling you right now, from experience for me personally, I found that the Word of God has been absolutely right. 
uh, it seems that he has preserved his word. And I've experienced it. I have found that when I've ignored it and done the opposite of what it says, what it says will happen to me happens. And I've found that when I do what it says and I obey the Lord, I've found that what it says will happen happens. I found it to be very true. I don't always enjoy finding out that it's true. I'm just saying oh, I love that it's true. I love that I have something I can absolutely count on. It's stable. It's established. And then I find that, you know, we're all sinners and Jesus is willing to forgive anybody that comes to Him and... and, and in repentance and faith and, and, and asking to forgive them. Praise the Lord, I can count on that. And then I get this thing forever called salvation. And then there's that forever, that eternal. And I still don't understand it. He goes on, he says in verse 93, he says, I will never forget thy precepts. That's thy word. For with them thou hast quickened me. He says, with the word of God you have brought me to life. The word of God has opened my eyes. The, the word of God has illumined me. The word of God has, has brought, quickened me. <laughs> brought me to life. Hold your place here. We've got to come back and look at the rest of these verses. But I want you to turn over to... Uh, uh, tell you what, turn over to 1 Peter. Uh, first, and we're, we're going to go over to 2 Peter here in a minute. But look at 1 Peter. He says, that he said in our verse, the word of God had quickened him. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 23. Being born again, that's saved. That's another term for being saved. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. There it is, forever. Look at verse number 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So in other words, when people, when, when preachers take the word of God or when a Christian takes the word of God and shares it with someone else and leads them to the Lord, and that person goes, wow, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm seeing what you're saying. I'm convicted by the Word of God and I want to get saved. That's what that's saying. And since the Word of God is forever, and when you get saved from the hearing of the Word of God, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, you get saved by the hearing of the Word of, word of God, guess what? Your salvation is forever. Because the Word of God promised it to you. Look at, uh, uh, let's, let's go back to Psalm 119 for just a second. It goes on and says, verse number 94. He says, I am thine. The psalmist says to God, I am thine. Save me, for I have sought thy precepts. I have I've sought thy word. Verse 95. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. Or in other words, consider thy word. And look at verse no, no, number 96. He goes on, he says, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. That, what he's referring to there is the Word of God being perfect. That word uh, perfection also has the idea of being complete. And he is saying, I have seen the Word of God completed. I've seen it in its completeness. I've seen it in its perfection. In other words, the psalmist is saying, I found the Word of God and it is perfect. He's saying that in his time when he wrote this, we either believe that or we don't. Right? Again, us believing it or not believing it doesn't change it. If it's true or not. I'm telling you though, the psalmist had the Word of God. We have the Word of God. Look at, look at 2 Peter. Look at this. Look at what, what Peter says. Go to 2 Peter now and chapter number 1. I want to read three verses. This should be the 
believe this is the last verse we're, verses we're, we're going to read. But look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 19. Listen to what Peter says here. He says, we... Okay, so Peter's saying... This is 2,000 years ago. So this is several hundred years after the psalmist. Peter's saying, we, people living right then with Peter... Also have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Boy, that sounds like Psalm 119, don't it? A, light, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. A light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. That's talking about Jesus Christ. It goes on, it says, verse number 20, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nobody gets to change this word. It means what it means. Nobody gets to change Jesus. He is who He is. Verse number 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. There is no way men would have wrote this. I'm convinced of that. John R. Rice, uh, I believe it was uh, the man that said... No man uh, could have written this, but he, he also said, uh, I, I can't remember word for word, I'm butchering this, but he said no man would have written this. Because in every, all, of human, all of human writings, you will tend to find that human beings make themselves out to be the victors or the heroes. They always do that. They always make, you know, they, they cover up their blemishes, always. Uh, they'll gloss over them. Uh, uh, I could go over countless examples. Whether it's, okay, you've got a hero in a story. Eh, yeah, I mean, he smokes the occasional cigarette, but he's saving the day. I mean, he's doing everything else right. And I'm not saying that cigarettes are the worst thing a person can do. I'm just saying he has his faults. They gloss over that. In fact, they make it even look cool. In fact, you're cool if you smoke the same cigarettes as he smokes. Um, yeah, this, this guy has a drinking problem, but he does all these other things right. So, the drinking must be fine. I'm sorry, that, that isn't, that's not right. I, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying that that person is the worst person ever. I don't believe they are. But they gloss over it. Okay. I just described John Wayne. It's no big deal, right? They gloss over it, don't they? Every movie, too. It's not some of them. It's all of them. It's no big deal. It, I'm sorry, it, it, is a, it is a bit of a big deal. And, and what I'm trying to say is, no matter who your human hero is, and, 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 and folks, I, I read biographies of people, I, I learn from people all the time, but whoever your human hero is, they have serious faults. And I'm telling you, there is no way human beings would have recorded their faults like this book records. David would have skipped over his. Uh, uh, Moses would have skipped over his. Peter, we just read Peter, Peter would have skipped over his. Uh, P Peter, instead of cussing and swearing that he never even knew Christ to a little bitty girl, he would have said, hey, Matthew, can we leave that out of, uh, of your uh, record? You know, just for, maybe don't put that it was a girl. <laughs> I'm telling you, if human beings were in charge of this, they would have glossed over it. But they didn't. They accurately recorded human failure. They accurately recorded it because it's the Holy Spirit of God recording it. And it says here in verse 21, look at this, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. If it had been the will of man, they would have changed it. They would have changed it. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's who recorded it. The Holy Ghost. Hey, listen, if you don't believe the Holy Spirit of God recorded this, then you've got some big problems. Because... You've got to explain how all of this word 
fits together with different human authors. What is it, like 70 of them, Brother Mark? Something like 60? 40. I don't, even, I don't even know how many. We're guessing because we don't even know who wrote some of these. But it, it's, it's so many human authors, and you have to believe that they are all perfectly understanding what the other one was writing about, and they're all piecing it together and putting it together perfectly. That takes a lot of faith to believe that a bunch of random human beings, by the way, most of them were uneducated. Most of them were just fishermen, or Amos was a, was a farmer. Peter and John were fishermen. Most of these guys were not educated, and you're, you're believing that just some random guys put this together. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit of God has preserved the Word of God, and it's right here. Amen. It's one of the reasons I stick. I, I I personally stick with the King James Bible. I don't I don't dislike people who don't or anything like that. I do tend to disagree with them. Here's why: because I've looked at how over the past two thousand years how the Word of God has been preserved. And first of all, it was it was put into Greek. We call it the Textus Receptus, which was the, the means the received text. And the Hebrew text was the Masoretic text. That's what the King James Bible is based off of. A lot of the newer English translations, I think they get off when they're translate. I think they're getting off on their Greek and Hebrew. That's my problem with it. I don't. I think guys have had good intentions, and I I, I get all the arguments and all that. My issue is with the Greek and the Hebrew that it's based off. I got some trouble there. I got some trouble. I, I, I'm afraid of it. I'm very afraid of it. I've, I've seen... Uh, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you think the Jehovah's Witness cult, and that's what they are, I, I don't hate them, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. But they don't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They don't. Do you think they've possibly tried to make some changes to the Bible? I'm telling you they have. Right with John chapter 1 where it says the, the Word uh, was God and, and the Word was with God. They'll change it right there because they'll say the Word was a God. They change it right there. And I'm telling you, there's little subtle changes. So I believe that God has preserved His Word. I do. And I believe He's preserved it in English. Amen. The English Bible has had the hugest impact more than any other book in history the Bible and the English Bible worldwide more than any other book this is the most published book ever I'm, I'm telling you I believe the Lord has preserved his word I believe we can trust it amen and I believe he's preserved it for us here on earth you can count on the Word of God abiding. The Word came down, written and incarnate. And I would encourage you to believe it. Amen. I would encourage you to believe that we have the Word of God. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I, I thank you for this opportunity.